15 minute or less lecture series anatomy and physiology chapter 15 digestive system and nutrition so the small intestine is about 20 feet long it uh, receives secretions from the pancreas and liver and it receives chyme from the stomach where it'll make the nutrients in the chyme become completely digested digested and then it'll absorb the products of this digestion and transports the remaining undigestible residue to the large intestine. Uh, the small intestine comes in three regions. There is the duodenum. The duodenum is a C-shaped turn that comes directly after the stomach. So it receives chyme, pancreatic juice, and bile. And it's the shortest portion of the small intestine. After that is the jejunum, found primarily in the upper left quadrant. Um, it, it is relatively mobile, so it's always in motion. And then after that is the ileum, which is the largest portion. It's directly after the jejunum, and it is mostly in the lower right quadrant. Again, it's very mobile, and it ends in the ileocecal sphincter. That leads to the large intestine. Uh, the small intestine is suspended from the posterior abdominal wall, wall by part of the peritoneum called the mesentery. As you can see here, it connects to all of the small intestine, basically. Uh, the mesentery has uh, blood vessels and nerves and lymphatic vessels that all go into and from the small intestine. Uh, the small intestine itself, when you look at it in cross-section, is lined with these finger-like projections that push into the lumen of the small intestine. These are called villus for one, villi for many. And this increases the surface area for absorption and also aids in mixing. The villus is lined with simple columnar epithelium. Um, inside the villus is blood capillary surrounding a large lacteal tube, which is part of the lymphatic system. The lacteal carries absorbed lipids and fats, while the rest of the nutrients go straight into the bloodstream. Uh, you look closer up, you see that there are a variety of different kinds of cells lining the small intestine, including the goblet cells that produce mucus, which is very important for lubricating and keep the um, lining of the small intestine. At the base are what are called intestinal glands. These glands secrete uh, watery substances to keep the contents, the chyme, nice and liquidy. Um, even closer up, you see that the epithelial cells themselves have little projections moving, pushing up into the lumen called microvilli. This also increases surface area for absorption. Um, embedded in this uh, portion of the Epithelial cells are various enzymes, including pepsidases that break dipeptides into amino acids, sucrase maltase and lactase that break disaccharides into monosaccharides, intestinal lipases that help to break triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerols, all so that these things get broken down chemically to the smallest um, possible structure that can then be absorbed. Uh, chyme distends the duodenum, the beginning of the small intestine, and this is the stimulus that causes the hormones to be released to cause the pancreas to release its contents and the liver and gallbladder to release their contents. Um, the small intestine is where most of the absorption of nutrients occurs. Uh, monosaccharides, amino acids, and nucleic acids all get absorbed directly into the bloodstream. It is carried through active transport and facilitated diffusion through the epithelial cells and then into the blood capillaries. Um, Water can also pass through by osmosis. Electrolytes can enter and pass through the epithelial cells by active transport. The uh, fatty acids, on the other hand, have a slightly different route. They get brought in by active transport in, um, they, or uh, diffusion into the epithelial cells. Uh, these are lipids, so they are hydrophobic. So they end up first getting broken down further by the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And then they get packaged with proteins forming structures called chylomicrons. It's these chylomicrons that are proteins surrounding the uh, fatty acids that then get sent into the lacteals of the lymphatic system. So it's now part of the lymphatic system and then gets carried eventually to the bloodstream. So the chylomicrons are very important because this is what allows the hydrophobic fatty acids and glycerols to be uh, carried in uh, the lymph and in the bloodstream, and then eventually get carried to the fatty tissues and to muscular tissue. Uh, cholesterol. So cholesterol has its own special system. It is produced by the uh, liver or is brought into our body from foods we eat. Um, it is produced in the liver 
and needs to head out to various tissues, including muscles and adipose tissue. Um, the way it works is that you have the LDLs, low-density lipoproteins. These are triglycerides plus cholesterol surrounded by proteins that get carried through the bloodstream and goes to the tissues of the body. So this is LDLs considered bad cholesterol because this is what's going to the tissues. So uh, there are various cells in the tissues. They remove the LDL from the blood uh, to bring cholesterol into the cells. However, sometimes if we have too much cholesterol, too much fatty material being transported, it can lead to plaques developing in arteries. Um, then we have the high density lipoproteins, HDLs. This is the remaining structure that is just proteins and cholesterol. And this is considered good cholesterol because this is being carried to the liver to be secreted in uh, bile. So HDLs is what's left over uh, from the LDLs that are returning to the liver. So here we see the VLDLs being transported into the bloodstream, fatty acids being sent to the various tissues. Then we still have um, uh, cholesterol out there in the body. And then finally, the cholesterol gets sent back to the liver by the HDLs um, and then secreted in bile salts in the bile. And then, of course, we absorb some cholesterol in the chylomicrons, which will also deposit that fatty material and the cholesterol in the tissues of the body. So again, HDLs are returning the cholesterol to the liver. Uh, movements of the small intestine, you have segmentation and peristaltic waves. Segmentation allows for mixing. Peristaltic waves moves materials along the small intestine. It takes three to 10 hours to travel the length of the small intestine. Sometimes we get really strong peristaltic waves, which may cause materials to move too quickly, leading to diarrhea. Uh, finally, the small intestine ends at the ileocecal sphincter. Um, it will open via the gastroileal reflex often after you have eaten a meal, basically saying, hey, we need to make room. We need to start sending the stuff in the small intestine out to the large intestine. So large intestine primarily absorbs water and electrolytes. It helps to form uh, and store feces until it's released via defecation. It's named because it has a wider diameter, even though it isn't, is not as long as the small intestine. It's only 1.5 meters long. Um, it has many different regions. The first compartment is the cecum that's receiving material from the ileum of the small intestine through the ileocecal sphincter. Hanging off of the cecum is the appendix. Then it goes up, the material will go up the ascending colon, then transverse across the uh, transverse colon, then down the descending colon through the sigmoid colon, it's kind of S shaped, into the rectum and where it's stored until defecation occurs and it passes through the anal canal and out the anus. So if you get a close-up of the anal canal, you can see that there are two sphincters, the external anal sphincter that we consciously control and the internal anal sphincter that we voluntarily control. Although if you store the feces for way, way, way too long, eventually you'll lose control of the external anal sphincter as well. Uh, structures within the wall of the large intestine are pretty much as expected. We have the mucosa with little intestinal glands that help to produce a little bit more fluid, but especially mucus to help materials move along. Uh, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa are all as expected. Uh, there is a strip of smooth muscle tissue that moves along the length or longitudinal of the uh, large intestine. This is called the tiny coli. It is constantly contracting a little bit, and this is what forms these little pouches you see in the large intestine. These pouches called one hostra, mini hostra. Uh, large intestine does not do digestion, but it does secrete some mucus, absorbs electrolytes and water, and houses lots of bacteria or natural microbiome. These bacteria are often useful because they crowd out pathogenic bacteria so we don't get sick, and also synthesize some vitamins, vitamin K, B12, etc. Again, via peristalsis, materials move from hostrum to hostrum. Also, you can have a mass movement or peristaltic wave that causes things to move really, really quickly. And Sometimes you need to release the feces through defecation, and once you get that started, uh, things get propelled by the defecation reflex. Uh, feces is all the undigested material, some water, electrolytes, mucus, shed, intestinal cells, and bacteria. Um, it's color and odor is due to the actions of bacteria. Uh, diarrhea is when you defecate too quickly, so the material of the feces is still very liquid. Constipation is when it stays in the uh, large intestine too long and becomes dried out and hard. Uh, colectal cancer, very extremely dangerous. Best to get a, occasionally get a colonoscopy to check for polyps that can get removed to prevent the malignant tumor's formation.
Nutrients, today nutrients and how the body uses them, and nutrients, anything we absorb that we need, macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, water. Uh, micronutrients are lots of things, uh, pretty much anything on a vitamin bottle, uh, vitamin A, vitamin B, iron, copper, etc. Uh, essential nutrients are those that cannot be synthesized by the body, so we need water, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, minerals, vitamins, lipids. Uh, carbohydrates get broken down into um, the monosaccharides that can then be absorbed. Uh, also, there's cellulose, which is a long molecule of carb uh, glucose that we are unable to digest. This is what this fiber. Fiber is the undigested carbohydrates. They help to move food through the intestine. Um, if get, glucose ever becomes scarce, then we may convert amino acids into glucose or uh, fatty material into glucose. When amino acids are broken down, it produces urea, which eventually we have to get rid of through the kidneys. Uh, carbohydrates needs vary from person to person, but somewhere between 125 to 175 grams. Uh, lipids, fats, they are commonly triglycerides is what we consume and use in our body, made of three fatty acids, one glycerol. Uh, we also produce and consume cholesterol. Uh, we produce all the cholesterol we need. Uh, saturated fats have all the hydrogens filling up all the carbons. Unsaturated fats have some double bonds between carbons, so they don't have all the possible uh, hydrogen. Uh, we break these down into um, glucose and three fatty acids. They get brought into the body and then often be absorbed eventually in the fatty tissue and the muscle tissue. There are some essential fatty acids that we cannot produce, omega-6 and omega-3, um, and the liver produces cholesterol and tries to regulate how much cholesterol is in the body. Um, the liver also controls uh, triglyceride metabolism. Uh, triglycerides undergo hydrolysis to fatty acids and glycerol and then get uh, brought in to the lymphatic system. Um, they can enter the citric acid cycle, so they can be used to produce energy for cellular respiration. Um, and then, as we mentioned already, we also have the issues with cholesterol. Cholesterol can enter the body from the chylomicrons, go to the tissues, and deliver cholesterol that way. We also produce all the cholesterol we want that are in the VLDLs and then the LDLs, and they are all taking cholesterol and fats to the tissues. And then HDL returns cholesterol to the liver, which is why it's the good one, because it's getting rid of excess cholesterol. And it's created in bile. It's hard to say how much we need, but, but the amount of lipids should not exceed 30% of the daily totals. Proteins can be broken down to amino acids. They are very, very important. They can be used for energy. Uh, there are essential amino acids that we cannot produce, so we have to consume those in our diet. Vegetarians and vegans can get uh, all they need if they have a diverse diet. Uh, excess protein can get converted into glucose and fats and lead to excess production of urea that goes to the bloodstream. Uh, proteins amount vary again from person to person. Uh, vitamins, organic compounds that are needed for metabolic processes. Some are fat soluble, some are water soluble. Uh, you don't need to learn all of them, but the fat soluble ones can be stored in the body and aren't stored by cooking, while the water soluble ones um, do not get stored in the body because they get secreted really rapidly out of our body. I don't see the big common one. It's very important for many functions. Minerals are soil, things from the soil, iron, copper, calcium. Etc., um, and they can be incorporated in structures or used in um, uh, proteins. Uh, they can also be important for osmotic pressure issues and functions of lots of different structures in our body. Here's a list of a bunch of them. Um, this is how we now talk about how the proper nutrition, the proper diet. Um, BMI is determined if someone is of adequate weight, overweight, or obese, but again, this can be a little confusing. But overall, it's best to be at your healthy weight rather than not within the healthy range. Uh, malnutrition is means you have poor nutrition. This can either be from lack of essential nutrients or failure to utilize them. There's undernutrition, people starving because they're not getting enough food and nutrition. And overnutrition, people are eating way too much and becoming very obese, which can also make them very sick.